and welcome back to the NWA 1983 Project. I'm your host, Lex G, and with me, as always, is Matt Riley. How are you doing tonight, Matt? I'm invigorated about tonight's episode. Oh, hell. Here we oh, go. Oh, yeah. So tonight's episode, we're going to take a look at uh, the incomparable Ron Garvin, <laughs> ICW, Southpaw Regional Wrestling. Yeah. But first, I have one question for you, Matt. Oh, no. Have you seen any leaked photos this weekend? Not leaked photos, but I've seen some leaked videos. Oh. Yeah, there was this one with a kitten. It was really good. Oh, that's gross. Oh, is there some other video you're talking about? (laughs) (laughs) So I know a lot of uh, podcasts and and other things are going to try to avoid this subject, but fuck it. I don't give a shit. That's Fuck right. Those guys. Fuck those guys. Yes. So apparently over the weekend, um, allegedly a page from WWE fame, her uh, cloud was hacked or or something happened with her computer where a bunch of nude pictures and videos surfaced on the internet. Which is awesome. <laughs> Well, you know, it's uh, you, people will say things like, "Well, you know, don't take a picture you don't want to leak out." Well, that's a privacy issue, whatever. Uh, I will say that you know, not going to go the route of like shame, but more good for her. You know, she's uh, like you expect a healthy twenty-something kid that likes to have fun, and she um, she's friendly. That's all. Friendly I mean, girl. I think we're at the it's time and place at, at this point where. Stuff like this happens so often that it's not necessarily a big deal other than like, oh, look at those, that person naked. Awesome. And then you move on. Um, you know, this stuff happens. I mean, it's – what was the first the first big sex tape leak that got out there? What was it, Pam Anderson in the 90s? Was that the big first? The first, the, I guess, the big mainstream one? And then you had your Paris Hiltons and your Kim Kardashians and yada, yada, yada and all, you know. All that stuff afterwards. I don't necessarily think it's a big deal. Do I think she deserves to be fired for it? Um, probably not. Again, it was it wasn't something that she put out there herself. At least that's that's what we think at this wow. point. And and uh, congratulations to everyone involved. That's that's awesome. <laughs> I, I would say this. I think the only way, I think it might be an inside job only because it's a fantastic. Um, Way to get yourself fired if you, if they take a hard stance against that. But otherwise, you know. But they have it in the past. Look at Seth Rollins. Everyone's ever in the world has seen his penis. That's true. No one gave a shit. So now when you go to MSNBC's homepage, it's right there. His so, penis? Yeah, it's awkward. It's like, uh-huh. why is that even there? Um, he's, he's the that's the background picture on my computer. <laughs> so, so there you go. Uh, no, I just I think it's social media, everything else. But I, I just believe that the stigma, not that it's. I mean, look at Kim Kardashian. Her whole career has been built out of a sex tape. Yeah. Otherwise, who the fuck is Kim Kardashian? Exactly. She's an attractive woman with a nice ass. <laughs> you know. Dime a dozen. Dime a dozen. Yeah, yeah. There was a uh, woman with a nice eye with a very nice figure. Like, oh, wow, look at her. She's great. You know, and, and there's lots of women with nice figures or people with you know nice bodies, but whatever. Uh, it's just when it's a celebrity and it's someone you know, it's I call it the teacher effect. Remember when you were a kid? And the first time you saw one of your school teachers outside of school, it was like, what the hell? So, like, when you see a celebrity and you see them either, like, like you know, not a TMZ video, but, like, an actual, like, they're getting it on, uh, you know, it, it's like, oh, it's different looking their their life. Uh, she just likes to have fun with, you know, two or three people. So good for her. Do you think she'll get any heat for having that NXT belt in one of the videos? That is actually the only thing I could say is one of the videos where uh, her tag team partner, um, Muta Miss, onto the belt. And uh, it was a Muta Mist. I do feel bad about for the other women who had, the, had that championship <laughs> afterwards. You know, was, unless that's a common occurrence, like that's like a rite of passage. Could like, be an initiation for all we know. I, I know, you know, who knows, so. Now there's been like, some I other... Just, <laughs> I'm just picturing... Oh, man, there's going to be a picture of, like, 
Charlotte or somebody else like winning the belt and kissing it and like, oh, I'm so uh, happy. Yeah, there's plenty of those out there. Oh, uh, oh, oh yeah. Now, the page turner. Indeed. <laughs> um, th- there's there's rumors and innuendos out there that um, there's rumors out there that there's other um, nudie pics of of different uh, <laughs> WWE uh, women nudie. wrestlers out there that exist. Uh, we've heard rumors about Summer Rae. Uh, looked at those. Those are those those could be fake. I don't know. Who knows? Um, but you know, at this point. You know, if you have a nudie pic that hits the internet, you should really... You know, I'll just own it at this point. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you know, there's there's rumors of a, a Sasha Banks sex tape out there. There's rumors of... Uh, we saw, I believe, which were, I believe, fakes of Alexa Bliss out there. Um, I think everyone knows my feelings on her at this point. Um, yeah. Good. Congratulations to everyone involved. That's all I have to say. Yeah. And, you know, I just think it's one of those things that's kind of uh, not as big of a deal anymore. As it's so, you know, it's like if it was 15 years ago, it would be like, holy crap. Now it's like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure how, um, what's his name, Alberto Del Rio feels about this. Oh, that's a whole different, that, 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 that's, a, that's a personal issue. That's a whole different um, yeah. Rum of discussion. I don't know if you'd be pissed or like, yeah, she does that shit all the time. You know, <laughs> you, yeah. know you don't know how he take it as a as a hot blooded Latin man uh, having a woman's <laughs> picture. Oh my god, is Grilla Monsoon talking commentary right now? Yeah, <laughs> that He's... hot blooded Latino Tito Santana's got to really fire up here. Yeah. Oh. Uh. So you don't know how he's taking it, you know, but you know. You know if you were a freak. You know. You know. And you can't be mad when they do freaky shit. Well, that's the thing. It's like, you know, people say things like, you know, oh, she's a freak, blah, blah. You know, well, yeah, it's the reason you married her. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And it's funny because the weekend before, I saw Paige in person. Oh, really? She, she was with Del Rio at the big event autograph signing. Oh. And for the longest time, I'm like, ah, she's not really that hot. You know, whatever. That's all in person. I'm like, no, nope, I was wrong. She's hot. <laughs> oh, really? Nice. And now, and now that these uh, pictures and videos have come out, I was like, yeah, good for you. You know, I don't think she should get fired. I don't think there should be any kind of negative repercussions on that. Um, no. She didn't pull Hulk Hogan on the tape and say something outrageous. No. You know, I think I think she's she's all good there. They're doing a movie about her. I wonder if that's going to be the happy ending of her movie. Really? Yeah, it's, it's it is executive producers The Rock. They're doing a movie about her and her life. Age? Yeah, Paige. Age? Paige. Yeah. The fuck for? Well, apparently, you know, let's let's talk about Paige for a moment here. We might as well. Paige is a daughter. She is. Uh, Considered by some people as uh, English professional wrestling royalty dynasty, kind of like the Hearts. Okay. In Canada, um, her both her parents, her mother and father, are both professional wrestlers, and yeah, so just kind of growing up in that English carny lifestyle and becoming a professional wrestler herself. I guess there's enough enough stuff there for her to, you know, warrant a movie. Oh, so there you go. Okay. And apparently, they had they brought in some indie wrestler to be AJ Lee in the movie, which is awesome. <laughs> really? Yeah, I wonder if Vince plays himself. So I think I think they're. She's gonna puke. She's gonna puke. Well, she's gonna swallow. Uh, well, uh, apparently not. Oh well, yeah, that's true. Good for her. Yeah. No, is there a disclaimer that this episode touches on adult materials? <laughs> Whoops. Uh, yeah, well, what are you gonna do? Here you go, kids. So, like again, like like I was saying, she was she's like the like the hearts over in England. Well, probably not as well known, but again, yeah. like her mother, her father, and her older brothers are all professional wrestlers. So there you go. Bless her heart. I'm proud of Xavier Woods. Good for you, Xavier Woods. 
They say all these all oh, these kids nowadays all they do is play video games and shit all day. It's like, oh, they're, they're keeping themselves busy. All right, good. That's awesome. Okay. So next up, we're gonna talk about Southpaw Regional Wrestling. No, Matt, I know you've seen the the videos. I've seen the videos as yes. well. What are your thoughts on uh, Southpaw Regional Wrestling? I enjoyed it thoroughly. Uh, it's the greatest thing I've ever seen them produce in a long while. It is really well done. I'll, I'll, I think it for me as someone who grew up on some Memphis wrestling to a degree, but also when I lived down in Georgia, there was a group called North Georgia Wrestling, among others. And what a shithole. And it reminds me so much of those broadcasts. Uh, it just the tone, the, the elements, the, the awkward interviews, the, the, the terrible promos to like introduce new wrestlers. Um, you people know. gotta understand. A lot of people were upset initially because they thought they were taking shots at Memphis. And I'm right? Like, no, 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 no. I mean, there's elements there, but no, 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 no. Watch your watch your indies or your outballs from the late '80s, early '90s, and that's what they're referring to. Go back and watch some of that kind of uh, five dollar wrestling, wrestle crap, um, kind of really awful wrestling. That was around yet, like you know, there's there's a couple of big hubs of indie professional wrestling in the late '80s, early '90s. Northeast uh, being one of them, Georgia being the second one, and then Texas being a third one. And if you go back and watch some of these shows that are like on public access television, and and yeah. that's what they're parodying. They're not really parodying kind of Memphis or like Southern wrestling. Uh, we had shitty professional wrestling up here in the Northeast too, so. <laughs> <laughs> and the gimmick now Luke Gallows who is Tex Ferguson he's been doing that character for like five years at this point really he does it on his podcast he did it he has a uh, he has a shoot interview as that character uh, on highspots.com which is the funniest thing I've ever seen in my entire life <laughs> his name is Sex Ferguson but obviously it's WWE so they changed it to Tex Ferguson um so that's not a new character. We've seen that one before, especially if you follow Luke Gallows. Um, it was a. It was basically, it's the whole thing is based on jokes that the guys used to make back like in OVW back in the day about like these. You have all these old timers coming in, and they were trying to emulate kind of the old timers. Are like they would kind of imagine you know, what was wrestling like in the eighties and, and that kind of shit. And yeah. they all had like little characters and shit, and kind of spun out from there. And <laughs> Chad, too bad. Is my new favorite wrestler at this point. Oh, really? Life. See, I, I like Chad too bad, but I loved Tex Ferguson and how he'd go from, like, you know, not injured to one eye patch to two eye patches <laughs> to his arms broken and his legs broken. <laughs> and I love the name of their big event, which is Lethal Leap Year. Oh, that was so good. That was the, <laughs> that was the best, like, four episodes in. This isn't a leap year. You ruined us. <laughs> I mean, that's just it was the best part. I thought one of the best subtle performances was by, by uh, Fandango as Ch- Cheddarfield. Yeah, as the alcoholic sidekick to Lance Catamaran. <laughs> and then flash forward, it was I was reading. You know, sometimes people online again, internet community. You know, tone it the fuck down, you sissies. Uh, someone made this huge article p- uh, about you know WWE showing its tone deafness by having Cena fight. Uh, Fandango and, and what's his face? The other guy, Tyler Breeze, yeah. and an LGBTQ themed match. And I'm like, the guy dressed like the valet. He wasn't doing it like whatever. Right. You know? He was doing it to mock the competition. It was a gag. It was fun. You know, like, don't be so sensitive. You got to get over it. Like, little shit like that. No, 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 no. Uh, but it was funny because even during the match, JBL was like throwing out, like, oh, Lance Catamaran and Ch- Cheddarfield have a lot to say about this match. <laughs> and not even trying to hide it, uh, no. but again, that's that's the way to do it. A subtle throw. Don't make it obvious, you know. But uh, I I enjoyed it, and I I love the the uh, Rusev as the, the hip big, big uh, Bartholomew. <laughs> yes, and, and who the hell was the sea lion or sea beast? I don't know. Uh, and uh, was it was it true that um the Mexican wrestler was uh what's his name uh the member of the Wyatt family. I mean, it could have been. Uh, it, it was just really, it was really funny. I know the uh, Ascension were the surfer dudes. 
And that, like, we were talking about it at work, and one of the guys, like, the next day at work, he was like, dude, I watched those. They were awesome. Like, right? They were so funny. And I think what's good about it is, like, they just know they're being, and you can tell by the way they're doing it, they're comfortable with the characters they're putting together. Right. And I think that's one of the things I, I stress at the wrestling school, and I said everyone who, like, plays the game, you know, whatever else, like, you've got to really believe who you are and, like, buy into your character. And that's why you see some of these guys, they're so rigid. And I know they're spoofing, but, like, it was dead on, man. Like, the, the cheesy setups, the promos, the static TV. Chris Jericho was fantastic. Oh, yeah, he was great, too. <laughs> it wasn't him, TJ Perkins, the babyface champion? Yeah. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> I, just, I, just, I just giggle and laugh. I hope they do more. I think that's a hit. Again, it's not. It's 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 fun. That's supposed to be fun. You're not supposed to take it serious, right? You know, I that's just that's just you know if you want to do ten minute videos and put them on the network or put them on YouTube, I think they've got enough positive reaction for it. And the best the best thing about the whole thing is the uh, commercials with Ric Flair <laughs> at the KFC. Yes. <laughs> Meet him behind the high school gym. <laughs> So if Ric Flair is giving a, a thumbs up, stamp of approval on that, you no one can bitch about the making fun of old school wrestling. Because Ric Flair is giving a thumbs up. He probably thinks it's hilarious. You know, it's, it's it's fantastic. And if you haven't watched it, please do yourself a favor, go watch it, go watch it today. Yeah, watch it numerous times. It is it is so funny. It's so well done and you can see they're having fun with it. I was the one thing I worry about is they'll push it too hard. Uh, you know, and kind of kill the momentum. It's like it's like the uh, a Saturday Night Live effect where they find a funny character and they put him on every show three times and they kill it. I, I will say, though, the question I'm thinking is will we see an ECW-esque one-night-only Lethal Leap Year pay-per-view? Maybe we'll do only an invasion. On, <laughs> only, only on the network. Like That'd be great. Like what day is April Fool's this year? Is it is it, is it Monday? Uh, it is on. Oh, it's Saturday, I think. Right. Saturday. That'd be a perfect day for a pay per view. You, you you get an old building like something that the WWF used to run back in the day, or maybe in Hershey, Pennsylvania, or White Plains, New York. Or <laughs> just do it. In a I, I seriously, I, I if I don't even sign up for the network yet, but I would sign up for the network probably to watch Southpaw Wrestling Lethal Leap Year event. So put that in your pipe and smoke it, guys. Yeah. I'm surprised that we might see indies pop up now doing that shtick. Well, I, here's, the, awesome. here's the thing. I think here's the thing people aren't realizing. There are indies doing that. It's not a shtick. They're still out. Like, if you go to certain parts of the country, there are promotions that still put out god-awful stuff like this. All right. You know, it's just, it's not funny. You know, like, we talk about the development of characters and, you know, wrestlers finding a certain character, like, there's... There was a guy up here in New England for a while called the Pink Assassin, and for the longest time, he was a terrible, like, gay, foppish bad guy. Right. And then when the gay rights movement kind of got big, he became kind of a fan favorite. <laughs> and he, he stopped wrestling, but I remember for the longest time being like... I, well, I, I missed seeing the quote-unquote face turn, but I wanted to see what how that happened, you know? But I think if you go to a live show, you're going to see a mix of of styles depending on the, the audience you get. You know, so if you go to a show, like let's say like a, a Ring of Honor show, you're going to see a more upbeat, fast-paced show. Whereas if you go to like a show at, you know, like a local high school gym or something up here, you're going to see, depending where you go, a mixture of matches. The age of the guys. And I think that's one thing I think is really missing from when you go to a show is the age of the crew. It's good to have a good variety. Like you have your at- Greg Valentine versus someone who had three matches. Right, like if you have all these guys who are like green as grass, you know who's who's you know, and they're all sting, you know, string bean, skinny bean poles. Uh, have some variety in sizes and shapes and age and, and appearance. And as much as we laugh at the Southpaw wrestling, all those guys were distinctively different characters. Oh yeah, big time. If you watch Two Hundred Five Live or if you watch Raw or SmackDown, there are a number of guys. If you get them, give a mic to them, they just have nothing to offer. Right. And it makes me wonder if you're well. We'll get into it yet later on, but but Miss Elizabeth. Elizabeth, if they can obviously be comfortable on a mic in a certain character persona, why would you strip it away from them and give them something and saddle them with something that's terrible? Yeah. So hopefully the Southpaw Wrestling, uh, Regional Wrestling, does wonders and helps people out. But I know somebody on this podcast who's got a T-shirt in the mail coming that says Southpaw Regional Wrestling. There it is. There it is. So soon to be 
Yeah, that be posted up there. Nice. He'll go with my Jim Ross. Good God Almighty, they killed him. And it's funny because going back to that Ric Flair commercial, if you look at the, if you look at, look at it carefully, on the bottom says Ric Flair paid impersonator on it. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Like, there's so many nuances and so many details on this that it's fantastic. You know, whoever produced this, they need a raise, they need a promotion. You know, it, it was such, such, you know, it was so well done. And, you know, I like to see more. And I wonder if John Cena was uh, summoning his dad. You might be familiar with uh, good old John Cena Sr. Not York only Woods. familiar, I work with a guy who's friends with him. Yeah. So every time he's at a show, he's like, yo, you want to check out? Come on down. I can tell you where he's going to be. You see him at church on Sunday. Like, like John up. Cena Sr. is a wrestling promoter, personality, manager, uh, kind of a throwback from, from yesteryear. <laughs> so I wonder if he was, you know, summoning his dad when he was doing that. That's, that was... Oh, definitely. That I, I'd say that and a little bit of Lance. Uh... Lance Russell's in there, Lance obviously. What am I? Gordon Soley. Gordon Soley, Lance Russell, too much. Bob Cottle, yeah. which, by the way, a uh, slight shout out to Brandon Bailey, uh, who does an amazing, I mean, an amazing Bob Cottle impersonation. Oh, we need to get him on the show then. Uh, he, he, we were talking once on the phone, and he just broke into it, and I was dying. You know, he just, like, so good. And if, if you don't know who Bob Cottle is, he was a wrestling announcer from the 80s. If you don't know who Bob Cottle is, go fuck yourself. How about that? Yeah, he's, he Jesus is, Christ. Yeah. You need to put up with fucking. David Crockett for fucking ever. That man's a saint. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Is David Crockett the worst announcer of all time? Get him, Tommy! Get him! He's up there. He's pretty uh, awful. He, he was, yeah, he was the shit. <sighs> he, just, he wanted a cheerleader and an announcer. The tour Tony Schiavone is trying to call a match, and he got David... Oh, get him, get him. He's on the hook leg, Tony. He's on the hook leg. He's on the hook leg. Oh, get, get him! Yeah, break that leg off! Essentially, he's a wrestling fan who... Be, he, he, He's nothing like a wrestling fan while he announces it. So he's actively like cheering for the baby faces. And he don't give a shit. Yeah, he just... And he would yell at the heels, and this is ridiculous. Oh, yeah, he was... He... <laughs> I forgot about that when he did get all mad at the horsemen. Oh, my well, God. what are you going to do now? They're going to kick your ass. My brother owns this place. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, Un-freaking believable. Yes. So South Pole, Res- uh, South Pole Regional Wrestling, everyone, please go check that out. Hopefully they'll do a leap, lethal leap your pay-per-view at some point in the near future. I was thinking to myself, if April Fools fell on a Monday or Tuesday, they should do it. I would say if it still has life and legs by Halloween, definitely something to think about doing. Because I think any kind of even a really funny shtick that really works well, go with it. You know, Don't yeah. just be like, oh... Uh, Halloween this year falls on a Tuesday, so maybe we'll see a SmackDown. It's like, we've preempted tonight's SmackDown to bring you Southpaw Regional Wrestling. Tell me that wouldn't just make people, the internet explode. Explode. Like, no one, know, no one knows what's happening. He's just, what? Yeah. And all the guys come out in costumes, like, you know, like, and, and the best part would be, don't even, like, never even acknowledge any other part of the show. No. I do the whole show as if it's two hours or an hour long broadcast of. And you have Hulk Hogan comes out as himself. <laughs> he comes yeah. in as Sterling Golden. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Sterling Golden. And by the way, guys, if you haven't gone, if you have not subscribed to the uh, High Spots Network, do that because you can see Sex Ferguson in his shoot interview. It is the funniest thing I've ever seen in my entire life, quite possibly ever. Oh. Wow. So. Oh, I can't give that enough praise. You can watch the trailers on YouTube if you're so inclined. Guys, what we're going to talk about next is the ICW, which is your international championship wrestling, who kind of reminds me of South Pole Regional Wrestling just a little bit. And that's why we're bringing them up here on this show. This promotion was founded in 1978 by WCW Hall of Famer. That's right. Angelo Poffo. He is the father of Randy Savage and Leaping Lanny Poffo. Now, it's considered at the time as an outlaw promotion, an independent, so to speak. They were not uh, a member of the NWA, and they promoted shows in direct competition to the NWA. Um, like I said, the promotion was founded in 1978 as a rival to Ron Fuller's Southeastern Championship Wrestling and Nick Gulas, uh, NWA Mid-American Territory, which... Is Memphis. Again, they ran afoul of everyone. So they're promoting in Vern, Vaganians, in AWA Town. They're 
they're promoting in the WWA. So that's why a lot of people would say that Lanny and Randy, because they ran such opposition, were blackballed from the NWA oh. and the WWF. That's why you've never seen them wrestle there prior. So you see a lot of guys, they came from Crockett or from Watts, and these guys were just you know doing their thing. Eventually... Randy and both both Randy and Lenny got to ruffle, wrestle in Memphis, and then from there they went to the WWF. But the ICW is completely insane. So Matt, I know you saw the clip. Tell me what you saw in this clip. Uh, it was uh, man, I might play it again while we're sitting here. Just I'll have volume off. Uh, but first starters using the Midnight Express theme music before wow. it was their theme music. Fantastic opening. Randy Savage smashing out with the belt. A gigantic brawl in the in the ring. Mass dude. Uh, another battle royal picture, you know, clip. Guy getting stretched out. Randy Savage with another belt. Somebody in a hog pen match. Guy wrestling a bear. Yes, a bear. Somebody fireballing the fuck out of some guy. Randy Savage getting thrown into a cage. Kendo sticks. Some kind of random thing. A dude getting kicked out of the thing. Chain matches. More battle royal. Tables shaving someone's head. Big guy under the giant smashing himself into the corner. More tables. Someone missing a knee drop and breaking a dude's face. Under the giant getting in with a chair. Randy Savage. Rip Rogers. Ivan Putski, I think. Oh, pile drivers in a parking lot. Pile drivers in the ring. More brawls. Randy Savage punching somebody else. Some dude breaking a board in his head. Randy kissing a snake. Some of the license plate. I don't know what that means. Someone getting for oh, Ric Flair getting hit body press maybe. I don't know. Couldn't tell what happened there. Ric Flair Pistol wasn't there. Pistol Watley with a plancha. Randy Macho Man Savage screaming. Kendo sticks. More kendo sticks. Elbow drop to the top. Midgets. I don't know who the hell that guy's supposed to be. Someone with a paper bag on their head. Now someone can throw on the top rope. It's all in Angela Mosca, maybe? I mean, just, it is mayhem. You're watching going, this is friggin' awesome. I'd watch this shit. Where's the library? I oh. ask you, where is the library? No one really knows. Apparently it was sold to Memphis, but there's not that many full-length episodes available anywhere. I mean, there's clips all over the place, you know, taking off t- people's television and what have you. But people thought that Memphis was completely insane, and it is. But ICW is nuts. Like, EC level, ECW level of insanity, bedlam, and destruction, all types of shit. And there's a couple of standout moments. You know, first and foremost, Miss Elizabeth can talk? What is this? Who knew that Miss Elizabeth can talk? Because you watch her on WWF television, she's... Talks like this. You know, she's always whispering and shit like that. So I see Miss Elizabeth there. She was the hostess of that show. Other standout moments is Ron Garvin. A brown-haired Ron Garvin. Oh. Now, Ron Garvin was the big baby face of the ICW, feuding mostly with Randy Savage. So there's a couple of things here. Number one, Ron Garvin exposed the fact that Randy Savage was really Randy Poffo, the brother of Lanny Poffo, and the son of Angelo Poffo, which was a big deal back then, I guess. To the point where they hand Macho Man, I guess, a picture of all three of them. He gets mad and smashes the picture over his face. <laughs> Another thing that stood out to me was that uh, Ronnie Garvin and Lanny Poffo, they uh, kidnapped Pistol Pez Watley. And they put him in a box. And they're like, Macho Man, we have a present for you. And Macho Man opens up the box. And it's Pistol Pez Watley dressed oh, in a no. wig. And women's underwear. Oh. And they were saying that he is Miss Macho. Oh, so boy. There you go. <laughs> and we saw guys like Ox Baker and Crusher Broomfield and all kinds of shenanigans, Tom Foolery, mayhem across the boards. Guys, if you have not seen the ICW, seek it out, check it out. I don't know what the fuck the library is. There should be somewhere. The, the fact that there's not on the WWE Network anywhere or there's not complete volumes available for the public is a goddamn crime. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I just want to quickly go over the roster of ICW. You had Barry O, my favorite, Bob Orton Jr., Bob Roop, Boris Malenko, Buddy Landell, Crusher Boomfield, The Big Cat, Ernie Ladd, Gary Royal, Pamela Watson, Julia, The Black Widow, Hotskins, George Reingroft, The Great Kabuki, Great Tio, Izzy Slapowitz, Jeff Sword, Lanny Poffo, Max Thunder, who's awesome, by the way, awesomely bad. Max Thunder. Yeah, look him up on YouTube, too, when you get a chance. Mr. Wrestling Tim Woods, 
The Miser, <laughs> also known as Angelo Palfo, Ox Baker, Paul Christie, Pez Watley, Randy Savage, Hustler Rip Roger, Ron Garvin, Ron Wright, Super Duper Mario, prior to Super Mario Brothers, that's weird, The Sheik, Tojo Yamamoto, Tony Falk, Tony Peters, Willie Monroe, Jeff Turner, Dr. X, Sam Diamond, also known as Spider-Man, and Bill Martin, the 1981 Rookie of the Year. So there you go. Apparently they had the Batten Twins, which was Brad and uh, Bart Batten. The Convertible Blonde, which was a, a, a three-man duo of Pez Watley, Rip Rogers, and Gary Royal. Hence the name The Convertible Blondes. Devil's Duo, which is Doug Vines and Jeff Short. And the Samoans, uh, which was the Great T.O. and Chief Tapu. Both who I've never heard before. Then their announcers were Tim Tyler, Edgar Wallace, Miss Elizabeth, and Robert Phillips Jr. as a timekeeper. So there you go. Shenanigans and Tom Foley all around. No one really talks about the ICW, but you know, it was completely... They would do crazy shit like this. They would call out Jerry Lawler on TV. And he, they would call him gay and all kinds of other nefarious terms on live television constantly. They would oh, well. call him fake wrestlers because they're in direct competition with Memphis. They would do they hit Macho would hold up signs like Jerry Lawler fears Macho Man. And apparently one time at a gym, Macho Man and his crew, Pistol Pez Watley, beat up Superstar Bill Dundee. Really? Uh, yeah, they had a confrontation in a gym parking lot. Obviously Bill Dundee was outnumbered, went to go get his gun. So Macho Man kind of grabbed him and and I guess beat him up with the gun pistol whipped him for a while. Wow. And, you know, like, because Macho is legit crazy. Like, he's fucking nuts. Yeah. And he would fight guys. They would fucking, they would go to Memphis shows and buy out the front row and cause, you know, problems and, you know, you know real promotional. Yeah. Not, not making fun of someone on Twitter like they, now, like they do today in terms of promotional yeah. world. Like, they would get physical. They would try to do, you know, shoot run-ins and, and try to beat up people from the back and, and it's funny because when ICW went out of business, Jerry Jarrett was the first person to call Randy Savage. He's like, you want to come in? And Randy was kind of shocked. He's like, really? Going, after all the stuff that I did, you want to hire me? He's like, yeah. You, got, you created this great angle. Now I get to make all the money off of it. It's fantastic. <laughs> That's true. So he brought in Savage and Landy and they had their matches with you know Lawler and what have you, and then eventually Randy had enough buzz where you know no longer blackballed and went over to the WWF, and then the rest is history there. So that is international championship wrestling in a nutshell. So one of the big stars coming out of international championship wrestling was the rugged one, the one man gang himself, Ronnie Garvin. Now, Matt, let me ask you a question. What are your thoughts on Ronnie Garvin? Any do you, do you think he's unfairly criticized? No. Okay. I found him to be a, a well. All right, I'll, I'll say this. I found him to be less than my favorite wrestler. He just was. I don't know. I just maybe it wasn't his fault. He was just always pushed. But I never found him to be an outstanding wrestler. He came across as sloppy at times. I liked when the whole. I will say I did like the whole Jimmy Ronnie Garvin angle with Ric Flair. That was well done. Yeah. That was a that was a good angle. I don't think I would have put the belt on Ronnie Garvin to basically hold it for a few like a month or whatever it was. Do you think that's the reason why you get shitted on so much? Yes. Yeah. Cause to me, like I I enjoy Ronnie Garvin's work. The hands of stone, like the whole punch someone in the face, knock him out kind of gimmick. He, you know, he did that really well. I think with the issues you know, for Ronnie was it was that championship win. And I think people will ha- have him in higher regard if he didn't have that championship run with uh, with Flair and the championship. Yeah. Uh, I think it really hurt him. Overall, I mean, his run in WWF was fun. He had great matches with Mr. Perfect and even better matches with fucking Greg Valentine where they just sat there and just beat the shit out of each other all the time. So I yeah. think for me personally, if you take away that championship, the NWA championship run, and you look at his career there, I think he was pretty solid in the ring. Um, and then, you know, a pretty solid star overall. And I think sometimes... You know, he's he's a much like Coco Beware, he becomes a punchline. Yeah. And that may not be deserved, essentially. He's the first guy I saw use the Scorpion Deathlock in the United States though. Before Sting, I believe. Dragon Fujinami's been using that fucking hold forever. So but yeah. I like Ronnie Garvin. And the reason why we bring up Ronnie Garvin, because he is fighting 
Macho Man Randy Savage for the Southern Heavyweight Championship on this show. And this is, well, it takes place in Memphis, obviously, for the Southern Heavyweight Championship. And I wonder who's going to win that match. That's going to be a barn burner. <laughs> they, they had good matches, too, him and Savage. Like, Ronnie had to be in there with a guy that could wrestle, you know, with him. I don't think Flair was a good opponent for him. But Savage was a good opponent for him. Perfect. Greg Valentine, like I said, those guys were all really, really good opponents for him. And eventually he became a pseudo-jobber. And we'll talk about jobbers here for a second. Um, Pseudo-jobber. Well, he he did okay, and then by the by ninety ninety one, you know they he dropped like a fucking iron boot in the ocean right to the fucking floor, and uh, kind of just sputtered out for Ronnie. He never really did anything after his run in the WWF, uh, unfortunately. But the one thing I've been noticing as of late, and I've been watching a lot of. Too much. Late 83, early 84, WWF, because I'm super, super obsessed with the WWF National Expansion. Obviously, we're doing a show by the NWA National Expansion, and for me to have understanding what I would do for an NWA expansion, I have to look at the only other national expansion that was successful, and that's the WWF expansion. And... And I took it upon myself to create a playlist on YouTube. It's 152 videos long, and I call it the Road to WrestleMania 1. And it starts from December 26, 1983, and runs right up until WrestleMania. So that's March 31st, 1985. It's 152 videos. I'm breaking them up. For me personally at home, I have all the footage, and I'm editing them together. and breaking them up in smaller portions so I can consume it better. And... Just January of 84 by itself is 13 hours long. It's the whole thing. I might do a show or something. I'm thinking about doing something with it, kind of going on a week-by-week week kind of reference on it. I don't know what I'm going to do with that. But but the one thing I didn't notice, and it, it's the most amazing thing, that they used to give jobbers wins over other jobbers. Yes. So they would mean more when the star came in. So i give you an example. They had Luis Rivera. He's a job guy, but they brought him in. And they gave him like five or six wins on TV, and he's on the feeding streak going on. So by the time they brought in Greg Valentine, Greg Valentine came in and killed him in two minutes. Yeah. But now how good is Greg Valentine? He took this kid that was an up-and-comer, and he fucking literally just broke his leg in a ring. That's basically the angle. He got him in the figure four, and the kid was fucking stretched out. So how menacing and how over now is Greg Valentine? Yeah. And you look at WWE TV right now, that these guys don't get enough wins on TV. Your undercard does not put over their undercard. So mid-carders are not wrestling other mid-carders to get wins. Like, there's no one's getting elevated. Everyone is stale and they're whatever slot they're in and no one's getting elevated, at least from bell-to-bell action. And it's a shame because I think you need opening card matches. You need, you need you know, how are you going to have a card that's going to be, you know, chock full of people who don't mean anything? It doesn't make any sense to me. To the point when I'm watching this WWF 1984, fucking S.D. Jones is getting wins. He's, he's a six-man tag team with Rocky Johnson and Tony Atlas. They're the world tag team champions. And in your mind, you're like, okay, we have the Samoans. They're taking on Tony Atlas, Rocky Johnson, and S.D. Jones. Who's losing there? Everyone thinks S.C. Jones is losing. Not the case. They fucking won. They brought it back, had two or three falls, and then S.C. Jones took the fall. But they gave him credibility, and I think the undercard guys, the midcard guys in today's wrestling have zero credibility because all they're doing is trading win. If they're even winning at all on TV. When was the last time you seen Zack Ryder win on TV? Um... Jinder Mahal. Any of these guys. Well, I can tell you the last time I saw Brad Maddox went on TV. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Good for you, Brad. People say that you're insane and you're a psycho. I don't think so. I think I think you're. Is he supposed guy. to be? Oh, I've heard his stalkerish tendencies allegedly. Oh, great. So uh, there you go. So I did ask uh, Dave Meltzer because um, I wanted more information about the WWF National Expansion and uh, where I could find it because I can't find hardly anything. Everyone talks about the expansion in very general terms. Like, oh, they did this and did this, and then WrestleMania, and then they're off and running. But I wanted something a little more in depth. And I asked Dave Meltzer, and he put me in connection with someone that knows more about it than he does. Um, he didn't write about it as it was happening at the time, so there's not a lot of information out there 
about it. Like, I'm just curious about a lot of different things. It's like, what were the sequence of events for that WWF expansion? Like, obviously, one day Vince didn't wake up like, all right, pal, we're going national. Like, there has to take a level of, you have to get your funds up. You have to get, you know, people in place. You have to have a plan to do something like this. Because on paper, there's no reason for this to actually work. You know, what markets are you trying to conquer first? Because to me, just watching it on TV and kind of following around the results and kind of the shoot interviews, it like they went after St. Louis first. They got the wrestling with the Chase TV show. Obviously, they, were, they, you know, they had the Northeast on lockdown. They picked up USA from Joe Blanchard's promotion, so they had that. And they had their two local you know, TV shows, which is Championship Wrestling and All-Star Wrestling. You know, they would add a Maple Leaf Wrestling at the end of the year. So you had Maple Leaf Wrestling as well. So I'm kind of curious about... Because eventually all these shows became WWF just syndicated television shows. So they would go into an area, they're like, oh, going to take over your wrestling show, we're going to keep the name, we want to just feature WWF wrestlers, and then eventually transition to just a WWF show. The only place they couldn't get that done was on TBS uh, when they took over World Championship Wrestling. And then watching those World Championship Wrestling shows at the time, they tried to do anything to get ratings on there. Like, they brought, they had Jesse Ventura commentate on it. That didn't work. They changed the name from World Championship Wrestling back to Georgia Championship Wrestling. So it was WWF Georgia Championship Wrestling. Like, no one took to it. Um, yeah. They had a Sunday, a Sunday show, which is best of World Championship Wrestling, too. And that didn't do anything either. So they did a lot of things to try to keep that. And lots of people say that, you know, Vince sold that to get the funds to produce WrestleMania. But the last show for World Championship Wrestling, the WWF version, was a week before WrestleMania. So Vince already had to lay out that bunch of money. Now, if you were saying this, that's why that's, that's a misnomer. If you're saying this, Vince sold WCW in case WrestleMania didn't work out, he would have enough money to float the WWF for a while. That's a possibility. But he didn't take that money so he could create WrestleMania. WrestleMania was already done in the books, promoted, what have you. And he wouldn't get, like, I don't know how million dollar transactions go down, but I'm sure you don't get that money in seven days. I think it takes time, right? Right. You get contracts, you got to read over shit, you know, whatever the fuck. But yeah, if you guys want to check out my WWF Road to WrestleMania 1 playlist that I have on YouTube, I. Have a link in the video here. I don't really expect anyone to watch it because I don't think anyone has that amount of free time. But if you're interested and you want to see various shows from that time period, just to gain an understanding about what's going on at the time. I'm look, again, I'm looking to kind of really dig deep and kind of have an overall understanding of what happened and kind of the timeline on it and kind of the thought process behind it. Because I think you look at an Impact Wrestling, you look at Ring of Honor, I think there's lessons that could be learned from the WF National Expansion that no one's looking into because a lot of people who were involved with that with Vince at the time are no longer around. So there's lots of trade secrets and kind of, you know, how they went from one cable company to another cable company and how they expanded their territory back in the day. Obviously, you can't take all that stuff, transition it or translate it into today's, but you can. You know, that's something that these guys should look into. So if you're at the Impact Wrestling, like, you know, looking into a major expansion here, you want to go bigger, you have to look at because that's the only one that's ever done it successfully. Yeah. Um, right from the beginning. W went national, but that was... took him six years to get fucking traction. Isn't the uh, the hot rumor that Ring of Honor might be purchased soon? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different things about ROH being sold. Um, and a couple of different scenarios there. I don't understand why people would want to buy wrestling companies. I don't understand why the WWE would be interested in buying a wrestling company, because you're not buying a whole much. You know, you're not buying a whole lot. Now, obviously, they're not in any financial... Ring of Honor is not in any kind of financial crisis where they need a buyout or they're going to go out of business. But, you know, if someone's going to make them off, they'll, they'll be more than willing to listen. Um, it, make, it would make more sense for an Impact Wrestling to try to buy them to consolidate to grow bigger. But it makes no sense for a WWE to try to buy them. All you're getting necessarily is a license to trademark. And maybe, and this could be the reason that they're interested, Sinclair Broadcasting, which owns Ring of Honor has Ring of Honor television on their syndicated networks throughout the country. Now, if the WWE wants to get on another syndicated network and just to have more TV out there on actual you know, television, then perhaps a deal with Sinclair broadcasting to, like, hey, we'll buy Ring of Honor, but you have to air our WWF show. 
you know, would it be like superstars or whatever on all your networks? That could be part of the deal, and that could be the reason why they're interested. That, and you could always add their library on the WWE network. It gives you more content. Yeah. Their content is king. Look at Netflix. So I don't know how many more fans you're going to get from a Ring of Honor library purchase. Um, most Ring of Honor fans, and I've been to 14 Ring of Honor shows in Midtown Manhattan at the uh, Hammerstein Ballroom. And they may lie to you and tell you they don't watch WWE, but they do. They all do. <laughs> now, is it going to really – are you really going to get, get 500,000 fans or what have you to subscribe to the network if you carry Ring of Honor you know, old stuff on there? Maybe. Possibly. I doubt it, though. Most of those people have it already. So yeah, I don't think you'll get a, rever- a return on your investment on that. I don't think you'll get more subs that way. Because I think the people that are, you know, Ring of Honor fans probably already have the WWE Network. Plus, if you're not going to keep it intact, if, you're not, if there's going to be no more Ring of Honor, then those fans are just gone to the ether. You know, they'll right. end up going to TNA or another Evolve or another promotion that will come up in the ashes. And they always do. So there's no issues there. Right. So what are your thoughts on a possible Ring of Honor sale? I fall into the field of, you know, if you're not going to use that somehow and, and really build off it some way, then why are you doing it? Right. Like, it's just, if it's just to grab talent, you don't have to buy them out. No, if it's for the library, I don't think anyone's... Clamoring for our, like, those... Right. Eight. Like, no one's like, yeah, man, Ring of Honor, woo! Saying it to be mean or rude, just comparatively. No, but I can see a better scenario where New Japan Pro Wrestling wants to make inroads in the United, inroads in the United States and they buy Ring of Honor. Yeah, or AAA. They want they they want to have another brand, so they have their AAA. They have the Lucha Underground. They want to add Ring of Honor to their to their portfolio. That makes more sense. Or Impact wants to buy them to grow their company. Yeah. Um, but the WWE, I don't think it's necessary for them to buy them at all. Like why? Yeah. Why? I mean, it's it's, it's not good for the business in in general. Uh, less you know, less places for guys to work and, and what have you. So, have you watched any Impact Wrestling? Because I haven't. Because I don't get whatever fucking network they're on. Uh, <laughs> I've watched clips though. I do not get that station, but uh, I've watched them online. Just check it out. I was watching it for a while when it was on TV, and then it was like you know back. It was Maverick TV or something. I had the channel for a while, then I moved and I didn't file us anymore. I didn't get it, so I stopped watching. But I I enjoy like EC3. I really enjoy his work. He's one of those guys, you know, like a Kenny Omega type who end up in WWE in the next couple of years. I'm not really a fan of their catchphrase of uh, make impact great. Yeah. I think that's going to that's gonna age poorly in the future. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's just going to age poorly. And you want to be timeless when you do shit like that. So you want anything current or, or you know, that kind of stuff involved. I, I like the guys that they brought in. Like I mentioned before, they brought in Bruce Pritchard and, and Dutch Mantel and Hopefully they bring Savio Vega back, you know, with Jeff Jarrett's running around. But for Christ's sakes, if this becomes a Jeff Jarrett show 2.0, I'm going to fucking shoot myself in the head. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be pretty ridiculous, and no one wants to see that again. I want to see young guys having great matches with personal issues. It's not that difficult, guys. <laughs> it's not that hard. So anything, anything that's going to offset from that, then I'm not going to be interested. I'm not going to care. They have to get back to basics. Definitely. I don't know bringing you know former TNA stars back from their glory two months is the way to go. And they brought back L- LAX with Conan, which was was hot for a, for a second. You know, it was really hot. I love them. I love those guys. You know, Hernandez and Homicide, they're fantastic. Yeah. But they're hot for a second, and they're bringing back LAX, but with different guys involved. You know, what are you doing here? Yeah, I'll see how it goes. I'm cautiously optimistic. I'm mean, I hope Impact does well. I want them to see get I want them to see possibly getting back on a bigger network, would it be FX or back to Spike again? And I want them running pay per views again. I I don't know if they're even running pay per views at all. I think they do. Just goes to show you though. I think they I think they ran one a while back, but it was like the last one. It's rough and I I wish them well, so Yeah. So it looks like their last pay per view was in January. So which was Genesis? Oh, it wasn't even Genesis, which is July twenty sixth, two thousand seventeen. A special episode of Impact was used as a replacement of Genesis. So no, they're not doing pay per views. What are you gonna do? <laughs> the, the highest rating, or the average ratings, they never did above uh, one point two. And now, right now, they're at 
a point two five. It's right back to where they started on the fucking Fox what's in that. I wish them well. I hope they do big stuff over there. I don't like the whole fucking they're trying to trademark the they're trying to trademark the broken Matt Hardy gimmick. Oh really? And they're not they're let, they're trying not to let him use that anywhere else. Because I guess it's the fear that they're bringing that to the WWE. So they give him a shit about it. You don't need that kind of negative attention. You don't need any of that kind of negative attention towards your company right this second. Right. You're trying to, you know, trying to get back fans. You're trying to rebrand. You're trying to do a lot of things, and and go, you know, suing the boys or doing going after the boys. It's gonna yeah. make guys not want to go there. Yeah, guys are gonna be like, uh, yeah, no thanks, buddy. You know, I'll stay Evolve. I'll stay at Ring of Honor. I'll stay at Lucha Underground, or I'm on. Uh, hopefully, WWE pick me up. But why would I go there? But you know, do the right thing, guys. Do the right thing. That's all I have to say. We are officially out of time, so check us out next time where we have our we have our go home show for our next huge closed circuit event. This will be live from Orlando, Florida. It will be Kingdom Come. That'll be Championship Wrestling from Florida presents Kingdom Come. Uh, the main event of that show will be Dusty Rose taking on Kevin Sullivan. Oh, <laughs> good. So that will be in two weeks' time, and you know our next show will be another cornucopia of great wrestling action throughout the. Entire NWA as we prepare for this show. Uh, after that, we'll be going to, down to Puerto Rico. That'd be awesome. And then we come back up. We go back to Jim Crockett Promotions, and we go back to the Greensboro Coliseum. And then after that, we have our biggest show to date. It'll be live from Atlantic City, New Jersey. Be on the lookout for that. It's going to be a really big show for us. Heading into WWF territory, folks. So... Let's be on the lookout for that. So for Matt Riley, I am Lex.